Terry Funk was the greatest, you know, I mean, he was the one of the greatest minds in wrestling. He was one of the greatest performers in wrestling. He did a million things in wrestling, out of wrestling. His story is incredible. You know, I mean, he he was around wrestling from birth. His father was a wrestler. He was around, you know, went from, you know, lived in a trailer park going from territory to territory. They settled in Amarillo, Texas. Um, his father became the big star in Amarillo and the promoter there. Terry was a college football star, um, married the cheerleader who he met in sixth grade and had a crush on from sixth grade on. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's a sad, sad day for wrestling. And Terry is just, uh, you know, there's just, I don't even know where, I don't even know where to start with Terry Funk. Um, well, we should start at the very beginning which you didn't want to do, but uh, okay. tell us about his his early years and. Uh... It was early his early years. You know he um, he grew up you know around uh, pro wrestling. Um, Did he I, always want to be a wrestler? He always was. He was always a fan of wrestling. I think that um, he. I think if he could have been an NFL football player. Um, cause he was, he got into camp in an NFL camp. I think he went into the chiefs camp or maybe, and the Broncos, definitely the Broncos though. Um, but you know, he was undrafted. He, you know, was a free agent, didn't make the team or anything like that. And then he pretty much went into pro wrestling, but I think it was destined that he was going to be a pro wrestler. You know, his dad taught him wrestling, um, you know, tough guy like his brother, you know, they were real tough guys and, um, you know, they did do, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to me because, you know, Terry and I were, were, you know, you know, everybody will say that they were really good friends with Terry because Terry was a very friendly person. Um, but I mean, I, it's, it's so interesting to me when I think about, you know, him growing up and, you know, um, if people said wrestling was fake. I mean, his father would, you know, I mean, he told me stories when he was like a little kid and somebody said wrestling was fake to his father and his father like beat the shit out of him. And it was hard for Terry to process that. And even later, you know, he always had mixed feelings about it. Because he was not a um, he was not a bad guy, um, but he also kind of understood how it was then, where the feeling was. I mean, his father impressed this on him: is that if you know if I don't do that, you know, it hurts our business. You know, if um, you if somebody wants to be a wrestler, and Terry had to do you know police work, you know, which is essentially if somebody came and wanted to be a wrestler when Terry was young, he had to beat the shit out of him, and it was not out wrestle him. I mean, you had to leave marks. You had to beat the hell out of him. Um, and Terry was not like, a, again, that kind of a guy, but he knew he had to be because his father would say, like, if, if you just out wrestle him um, or blow him up, he's going to go, hey, you know, like uh, I fought Terry Funk and, you know, I mean, um, you know, I held my own with him or he'll make some story up or he wasn't that tough. And it's like, you got to leave a mark. You got to hurt the guy. And then he wasn't fond of that, but he understood that. And that was kind of like the start. But for a guy who brought was grew, grew up in that in that, with that mentality, I mean, it's one of the things I was thinking about. And I've been thinking a lot, you know, in the last whatever it's been, you know, you know, since since Terry passed away on. That's all I've done is think about Terry and all the different subjects that relate to him. And there's so many. But um, and I'll actually bring up a, a Hogan story in a second um, because it sort of relates to this one. Um, but how he and I, you know, in the 80s, this is not like in the 90s or the 2000s when, you know, every cat's out of the bag. I mean, in the 80s, I mean, he was one of the first guys who, um, you know, like embraced me, you know, and it's and, and taught me, you know, and whatever reason was his reason. I mean, we just got a, I mean, he, I wrote an, I wrote an article on him and he, you know, he appreciated it. But um, and, and, and a guy named Kit Bauman, who was. Um, writing a book on Texas wrestling that never got published, but was very close to Terry, you know, just, and I was friends with him and they, he kind of put us together, you know, when I was very young and, um, you know, we just always got along and, um, you know, he taught me a lot and, and in the end, you know, he would, he, he, you know, always, you know, was a big proponent of the observer or at least always read it, you know, cause we talked about my writing and different things in there for, for years and years and years. And, and he would, you know, he said many, many nice things about me. You know, I mean, um, he, he asked me to write his book, which I didn't have the time to do, unfortunately. You know, and I and Scott Williams, who was one of my best friends at the time, I said, like, Terry, I introduced them. I said, Terry, Scott is going to do, a, Scott will do a good job. I recommend you 
Scott, had, you know, I recommend you, you know, using Scott. And Scott was a big Terry fan, and they be they hit it off, and they became great friends. Um, and yeah, Terry, um, you know, he was an icon in Japan, obviously. But I mean, he was a he started his career as you know the college football player who turned pro wrestler and the son of Dory Funk Sr. So he was a star from day one. And he was going to like St. Louis, which was like the big wrestling capital very early on from his father's influence. But he improved, you know, I mean, by the time it was the late 60s, you know, he'd only been in the business for a couple of years, but he was, you know, already lauded as one of the best that there was. And Dory was world champion and he went all over the country as the guy who was Dory's quote policeman, which is a different term of policeman. But the idea is that Local babyface, you know, would be going for the title and Terry would try to just beat him to knock him out of contention. And of course, Terry's role was to lose and make the guy look good for the match with Dory that would come later. And that was Terry's role all over the, you know, all over the country. You know, in Amarillo, he was like the local's top star because Dory was touring. So he became, you know, originally they, they, they made Dory like the technical funk brother. And Terry was the king of the techs, the, the king of the chain match the father was the king of the death match but he also did the death matches and everything so he did the wild bloody matches you know long long before that um you know the the hardcore stuff that that he was known for you know as far as like worldwide and everything like that but he he adopted that kind of um you know match style he was the brawler dory was the technical wrestler the funk brothers you know one of the great tag teams in history um you know, at, at that time, he started going to Japan and, uh, you know, big, big villain in Japan early on. And then eventually, um, res you know, he became world champion, which was a very respected position. So it was, you know, he wrestled Jumbo Saruta as world champion. And, and then after his world title run was over, um, Dory and Terry pretty much became icons in Japan when they turned babyface and, um, you know, against the Sheik and Abdul the Butcher. It's a, the very first they they put the the world tag team tournament, which of course for years and years and years and years and years was the biggest thing in Japanese wrestling, um, the All Japan tournament, and they put it on the map with that first match with the Funks and Sheik and Abdullah. It was the tournament went so well it became every December, you know, November December, it became a thing, and it still is. You know, here we are. It started in 1977, so it's um, you know one of let's see that that'd be um, 40. This year would be 47 years, right? So that would that would be. It's not the oldest institution in wrestling because the oldest one would be the CML anniversary show because that's going on 90 years. But um, you know, you could go. I guess say it's the Champion Carnival that became um, uh, the World League that became Champion Carnival. You know, may go back earlier, but it's one of the oldest institutions in wrestling. And um, you know, Terry became Terry retired over and over and over again. And um, you know, he would you know. He would always tell me, you know, I think this one's it. And, and, you know, it never was, but, and sometimes he would retire for a while and he goes, you know, I think this one's it. I think this one's it. Um, I think at the beginning when he would say that, I don't think he was serious as he got older. I, you know, I mean, I actually at times. So, so his very first retirement, his very first retirement was actually, it was never like a big publicized thing, but I remember we watched for a while. Um, the Amarillo promotion tried to promote in, in the Bay area which was, uh, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's when Murdoch and Mulligan owned it. And um, when they were on, so we got, we got their TV, and they had mentioned, like, Terry had retired, but that wasn't, you know, and Terry was, you know, he tried to be an actor, you know that. Um, so, like, you know, he, he, he met with Stallone, and they uh, created the movie Paradise Alley, and that was Terry's. But, it, but his first retirement, when he retired for the first time. Yeah, that would be. His intention was. No, 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 I don't believe it. Okay. I don't think he. I mean, I think in the late 70s, um, well, I mean, I know in the late 70s he wanted to slow down because I remember Larry Matisic had told me a story going in the late 70s where Terry was talking about retirement. This is late 70s, and, and Larry's thing was is like, you know, just work St. Louis and, you know, with the, the, the amount they paid the main eventers and everything like that, it's like, you know, you could make a, a nice living, you know, um, just working, you know, 12, 15 dates a year here in St. Louis and we can feature you. And you'll have plenty of time to pursue acting, which was what he was trying to do. So that was, there was never a formal retirement, but when um, the Murdoch and Mulligan ran, I remember like the announcers mentioning, um, you know, 
Terry retiring, but not in a way where, you know, I bought it as a retirement or anything like that. The first famous retirement was Japan in 83, which, you know, that was due to um, New Japan was, I mean, all Japan and New Japan were bitter, bitter, bitter rivals in, at this point. And um, Terry was the guy who, who, you know, Terry was in the middle of so many things. Terry got um, Hulk Hogan, um, the Rocky Three gig. Um, Terry was a big proponent of Hulk Hogan. Um, and then later, you know, you know, I mean, and, and, and they were friends, but there was also a, an incident in Japan. It's kind of a famous incident. Is this the Hogan story that you wanted to talk about? Well, I actually... Is like, that a different one? There's like 10 Hogan stories. Okay, well, tell this one. Okay, so um, this would have been... So we're going into like all Japan, New Japan. The, the promotions were at war. I mean, they were really at war. Baba and Inoki and, and Terry, you know, we'd always, he was, he'd, like years later, Terry would go, you know, like, and, and even like I knew Terry and, and he, when, when he hated Inoki because they were rivals and it was just like they were in a, that war, you know, that he had that mentality. You know, he hated Antonio Inoki. And years later, it was, he had great, ended up with great respect for Inoki and wouldn't just go like, you know, it was just business. Why did I hate him? You know, um, and uh, but but he really, you know, he did because that's how deep that war between the two was. So and one of the key things that he did, you know, um, you know, Inoki Lord Abdullah, who was Terry's, you know, big rival in Japan. Um, I just remember once when we were, you know, like in Japan, when wrestlers would would see each other or bump into each other, you know, they were it's like the mentality was like, you know, you don't whatever, you know, you don't. um I'm getting off on a tangent here, but you don't like, you know, if you're in the hotel, you don't create a scene. You know, you're respectful businessmen, right? You're, you're respectful athletes, you know, like Luthez and Ricky Dozan, you know, started that. They were big rivals, but they would be seen together in public because they were just two athletes who were competing. And in Japan, that was kind of the thing. I mean, the people who were rivals did keep apart, but I remember um, like Terry with Abdullah, like, we were once this is this is later 70s later 80s um terry was going into the hotel and i was with him and, and abdullah was coming out and i mean it was a scene you know what i mean because there, there were there were there were fans there and it's like it was like if there are fans there you know what i mean it's like i can't be respectful to abdullah that one's too big so anyway but abdullah at one point switched to anoki and and there were others that were, went back and forth, but Terry, the big coup was when Stan Hansen switched from Inoki to Baba, and Terry had spent like six months um, prior to that or more um, starting the thing, but Terry was the one who was the catalyst for Stan Hansen with All Japan Pro Wrestling. So getting to the Hogan story, um, among many, you know, um, the, you know, the, like again, with, with Stallone, you know, he was, he was good friends with Stallone, and, um, you know, he was in, um, um, you know, Paradise Alley, which was Stallone's attempt at a wrestling movie and not a big success or anything. But Terry thought he was going to be an actor because he did very well in that movie and, um, you know, got Hogan on. Um, it was Hogan, John Studd or Gorilla Monsoon, I believe, were the ones um, that he suggested to Sly and Sly, you know, um, you know, picked Hogan, but he was the one who he also recommended Hogan. So that was a big, big break for Hogan getting in, in Rocky three. And he tried to get Kerry Von Erich as the, the Russian, you know, that Dolph Lundgren played in, in a later Rocky movie, which would have been incredible, but you know, Kerry didn't do well on the, you know, the screen test. He couldn't remember the lines and, and, you know, Dolph Lundgren got the spot. But anyway, so back to this Terry story, they had a match. Hogan and Terry had a match in um, Cape Town, South Africa. This is while Terry is one of the big stars of all Japan. Hogan's one of the big stars of New Japan. So they really shouldn't have even wrestled politically at the time, but it was South Africa. So it was kind of like, you know, who's going to know, right? And, um, you know, so Hogan comes back. And I don't know if Hogan won by DQ or Hogan won by pin, okay? Um, I, I, you know, I'd have to look that up. But I know that, you know, Terry, you know, it, it, it could not be in Japan that Hulk Hogan pinned Terry Funk. Baba would have thrown a fit because, you know, um, it would be a New Japan guy beating one of his top guys. So Hogan comes back. So they had a, in, Terry thought um, strongly that they had an agreement that they would never talk about the match. So Hogan comes to Japan and I beat Terry Funk in South Africa. So Terry blew his stack 
and he went to the Keo Plaza Hotel, which is where the New Japan guys, and went on, they got Hogan's room. He had all of the freaking Japanese photographers with him, or not all of them, but he had, he had some reporters with him. Because um, I actually heard the story first from reporters, but Terry and I talked about the story many, many times over the years. He's pounding on Hogan's door, you know, and, and he was gonna, he was gonna fight him. You know what I mean? 100% he was, you know, furious, gonna fight him, pounding on the door. Hogan wouldn't answer the door. And like, it was never really covered. It wasn't covered in Japan, but it was like a kind of thing that inside fans knew. And it was kind of one of those things where Hulk Hogan was afraid of Terry. You know, that's how it was portrayed. Like the inside fans like, oh, Terry could kick his ass because Hulk Hogan wouldn't even, you know, Terry's challenging him and Hulk Hogan wouldn't even answer the door and let him in or anything. And I just remember like, as Terry got older, he just goes, why did I ever do that? He goes like, I'm, he might have thrown me out the window if we had gotten in a fight. That would have been the stupidest thing. But at the time, you know, it was just like, you know, that's how deep the war was. And that's how pissed off he was about, you know, Hulk Hogan. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that notify button and you'll never miss a video again.